grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Anybody here not look in the mirror at least once a day? Anybody? Anybody here use a blindfold when picking out your clothes for the day? No? Anybody here put yourself into debt so that you can stay current with technology or a house or a car or fill in the blank? Mm. You don't actually have to raise your hand, but I'll take your confession. <laughs> Anyone continually credit themselves for the work that they do so there's no doubt who the worker bee is? Why do we do these things? We care about what other folks think, perhaps too much. We want them to admire us, to love us, and we think how we look and what we drive influences that too much. And the scary part is sometimes it actually does. Well, pastor, those are all superficial things. If it came down to it, I could let all that stuff go. If that's what people see when they see me, they're not worth it. Sounds good, doesn't it? Do we really feel that way? So, in that case, anyone here ever said, if you loved me, you would? Anyone here ever kept a scorecard or a tally of the acts of love given and received to try to stay even with the other person? Anyone ever given a time frame on love? If he doesn't propose by this date, I'm just not sure I can continue this relationship, for an example. Is that hitting a little closer to home now? We've all kind of asked those questions. Some of you are still laughing because you got stories I want to hear. <laughs> we've all asked those types of questions. We've had those thoughts. We've questioned our own worth. We have put limits and parameters out there for other people, whether they knew our rules or not. It's messy, this thing called love. And the myriad of conditions and rules and games that we can play around love. We cannot love well or completely on our own, even when we try. And because we can't do it, we can't begin to understand how God can do it. We're in the dark. And God is light. There are all kinds of behaviors and actions that we say constitute love. You know, five love languages, we're familiar. But God's love is about function. God prepared a way to demonstrate his love for us. He committed to it. His love is about saving us from ourselves as only he can. So hopefully you have memorized John 3.16. Don't look. Say it with me. I think you can. For God so loved the world. Yeah. We have that engraved in our hearts, I hope. If not, work on that. Okay. I hope that we do. I pray that we do. I also very firmly have believed for years that our teachers and our preachers should make sure that we continue into verse 17. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. But there's one thing I've heard repeatedly from folks who are Christian, but not Lutheran necessarily, is this. Why do we have to feel bad to feel good? It's true. You know, the very first thing we do when we come to worship most of the time is confess our sins, right? Why do we have to feel bad to feel good? It can come off that way, honestly. It's true that we do confess our sins, that the serpents bite us every single day. So to the one who knows about all of that, all the ins and outs already, we confess. As I say in home communion frequently and in ecumenical services especially and especially in nursing homes regularly, we get 
to lay our burdens down at the very foot of Christ's cross. Anything, not just sins committed, not just that, I mean, confession also means confessing Jesus as Lord. That's a big, big positive. But we actually get to lay anything that's taking weight on us. We get to lay it down. Jesus tells us to do that. He wants us to be light children, capital L, children of his light and therefore lighter. Lay our burdens down where his yoke is easy. Our burdens are light. So the reason we begin worship with confession is to receive the freedom from our burdens so that we can worship God more joyfully, knowing that our burdens are absorbed by the only one with the power to really take those burdens away from us. And not just here. That's also why we share the peace of Christ with one another, especially just before sharing God's body and blood with one another through Jesus Christ and communion. It is the forgiveness factor. It is the kind of love that frees us. It is not feeling bad to feel good. If that's what you're feeling, I'm sorry. It is laying down your stuff to the one who can pick it up and heal our spirit. The Israelites were in some big trouble. They had been bitten hard by poisonous serpents, and the Lord told Moses to make this image of a serpent and lift it up on a pole for them to see. A public display of the powerlessness of a snake. Those who were perishing were saved. As if he had sucked the venom right out of them. And we've been bitten by the poisonous serpents of our day, no doubt. The focus on the superficial a competitive nature that insists that we look out for number one, ourselves first, blindness to the truly needy around us. The list of what's wrong in this world is long and it is exhausting. It's even worse when we realize the truth that we do incorporate and sometimes promote our own idolatry issues. The things we place before our discipline toward God, idols, and most anything can become that. If God kept scorecards, if his love were as conditional as ours, if his grace did not exist, if he set the timer, if he were anything less than the ultimate example of love in action, the name of Jesus would not even be a part of our vocabulary. Ever. God loves you. In me. God loves us in spite of ourselves. God loves us enough to send Himself, His Son, to be lifted up on a cross to save us, to take the sting out, to take away the venom. If you have ever doubted God's love for you, you are not alone. I don't think I've ever met a person who didn't, at least a little bit, when stuff happens. More than likely, every single one of us through the course of time has doubted his love at some point. And in today's scripture alone, quick recap, you ready? The book of Numbers, admittedly not my favorite book. The people of Israel were impatient. They did not think that God was concerned about them. They looked up at the bronze serpent and utter dependence and saw that God would in fact rescue them after they doubted him. Psalm 107. The fools with sinful ways who suffered affliction, who drew near to the gates of death, they cried out to the Lord in their troubles, and he delivered them from their distress. Ephesians. We were dead in our trespasses, but are made alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved. And then there's gospel writer John. Jesus is lifted up on a cross and we dependents are not condemned. We are given new life in him. So, don't know if you're a Maya Angelou fan. I am. Whether or not Maya Angelou intended her poem to be a love letter from God 
as I reread some of her poetry, there's one that stuck out that's perfect for this. It's called In and Out of Time. It struck me differently. And I would spell sun differently, like I do for sunrise services. The sun has come. The mist has gone. We see in the distance our long way home. I was always yours to have. You were always mine. We have loved each other in and out of time. When the first stone looked up at the blazing sun and the first tree struggled up from the forest floor, I had always loved you more. You saw me bludgeoned by circumstance, lost, injured, hurt by chance. I screamed to the heavens, loudly screamed, trying to change our nightmares into dreams. The sun has come. The mist has gone. We see in the distance our long way home. I was always yours to have. You were always mine. We have loved each other in and out, in and out, in and out of time. God, our God, loves us. He loves us in and out of time. Last week, we talked about the teeter-totter and how God's desires include relationship with us. And alongside of that teeter-totter, we need to recognize that Jesus is with us in every circumstance, in every moment of every day, in our life and death situations, in those split seconds that feel like an eternity when decisions have to be made, because Jesus gives us life after death, and he gives us life while we're here. That's real love. That is real love lifting us out of the depths when we were baptized. In and out of time because the Holy Spirit is involved. That's real love from God. Jesus giving his body and blood for the forgiveness of sin. That's in and out of time. There are no expiration dates. There's no checklist of proofs. There's not a single thing that you could ever do to stop God from loving you. Ever. He loves on his terms, no matter how disobedient we are. His terms are in and out of time. He is not some sort of flippant, overdone, variable, take it or leave it, abusive, manipulative, or surface infatuation, fickle type of love. His love is not even the most dedicated of spouses caregiving and fulfilling on a human level type of love. God's love goes way beyond the best of our bests kind of love into places that we like to keep in the dark. God shines light into those dark spaces and still loves us. God's love is never wavering, never faltering, even when we don't understand what he's doing. Even after we've turned away and turned back, hopefully. Always present. Never, ever going to let you down above any kind of love you can possibly imagine. God love. Create in us clean hearts, O oh God. And renew a right spirit within us. Thanks be to God for that kind of love. And the peace and love of God, which surpasses all of our understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.